Right. So, um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Concealment Shed, I'd like to welcome you all to this talk by Dr. Tim Jackson. Tim is a stalwart supporter of all things that go on in the shed. And uh, from the moment we got started, monthly suppers, monthly sing alongs, hospital entertainment events, lectures, etc., Tim hasn't missed one of these. Now, Tim joined the Men's Shed as a member just in the, in the latter end of 2020, but due to COVID restrictions, he has not been formally, formally initiated into KMS. Mm. So there hasn't been any swearing in ceremony yet for Tim. So as you can imagine, it's been an anxious time for him while he waits, waits for this to take place. Now, when, when fully initiated, Tim will, will then be afforded full membership rights. On the 31st of February, he may drive his sheep in the front door of the shed and out the rear door between the hours of 10 a.m. and 11 a.m. He will be allowed to use this, the shed secret handshake. We haven't been able to show him that yet. And he will also be allowed to graze his sheep in the shed backyard between the hours of 12 midnight and 8 a.m. So the list goes on and on. But anyway, don't worry, Tim, we will get you initiated soon. So Tim has worked in public health most of his working life, and he's been very good at that work. He's a good poet, a skilled sailor, a bit of a physicist, and an engaging public speaker. He is also a well-traveled man, and we'll hear about that tonight. Now, over the weekend, Tim and I were going through the programme for tonight, and Tim said to me, gee, I feel I've been very pushy about the delivery of this speech at the Shed. And I said to Tim, the last speech you did at the Shed was in 2015. And I said, um, a speech by you every five years or so could hardly be described as being pushy, Tim especially when you have something to say. So, uh, Tim, just to reassure you, we're very happy that you're doing the speech here tonight. Thank you. Now, we, we will have a 10-minute intermission, not that we hardly need it at this stage, but anyway, we'll have the 10-minute intermission at around 8 o'clock where people can get a drink or use a toilet or whatever. And when the speech ends, we will then have a Q&A session and if anyone wants to ask a question, they can raise their hand at that time. No questions can also be put on the chat there on your screen and make them for the attention of Bernard. And uh, we can put them questions to Tim then at the, in, during the Q&A session. So I'm now very happy to hand you over to our speaker, Tim. Okay, well, I'm just taking on share screen now. Uh, yeah, you can, yeah. And that's okay. That's crazy. Now, Bernard, I've got my screen up. Can you see me? No, you haven't shared it yet, I'd say, Tim, have you? Sorry, hold on. Now. You have disabled screen sharing, so you'll have to enable me. Uh, oh, to sorry. Right. One second now, Tim. Um, uh, security. Right, Tim. No questions can also be put on the chat there on your screen and make them for the attention of Bernard. And uh, we can put them questions to Tim then at the, in, during the Q&A session. So I'm now very happy to hand you over to our speaker, Tim. Okay, but I'm just taking on share screen now. Uh, yeah, you can, yeah. And that's okay. That's crazy. Now, 
minute. I've got my screen up. Can you see me? No, you haven't shared it yet, I'd say, Tim, have you? Sorry, hold on. <coughs> now. You have disabled screen sharing, so you'll have to enable me. Oh, to sorry. Right. One second now, Tim. Um, uh, security. Right, Tim, try it now. Yeah. You're still showing up as well. Oh, yeah. Good no, lad. that's fine. That's fine. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> right, lads. I'm sorry, I've gone into the middle of my lecture, which is not going to be there. Yippee, yippee, yippee. Right. Now, you're. Hold on a second, let me get my. Sorry about this, lads. The usual tricky, tricky mix. Yep, we should be there now. And your pictures. Hold on a second. I want to squeeze you all to one side there because I want to see you can see me, but I just seeing too much of you on my screen. Yeah, <laughs> that should be okay. okay. Yeah, far too much of you, in fact. No, no, no. Tim, that's very offensive. <laughs> so that's it, right. Okay, we'll get going. This is a journey that I made in 1969, over 50 years ago. And this is the story of that journey and the context and everything that happened. So uh, bear with me, it's a lot of slides, but a lot of our quick glimpses of stuff to photograph. But some of them I talk a bit about them. So here we go. Now, why can't I go? Here we are. Uh, this is, I was born in India, in Bombay, now known as Mumbai, in October 1945. That is a picture of me as a child with my mother and buying stuff in the streets, as you can see. We moved to Quetta and partition took place in 1947 in Pakistan. You can hear me okay, can you? Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I'm just checking. Bernadette, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Yeah. Good. And you can see me okay. Good. Okay. Um, now, the situation was the parents, this all starts, of course, like all life does, it starts with your parents. And in my case, the parents went to India in 1937. My father was a Carlo man, George Boyce Jackson. He qualified in medicine in Trinity with his brother Frank in 1936. And he then joined because there were no jobs in Ireland in those days. As you know, the famous McCarthy pub in um, Aidan McCarthy was in a similar plight in West Cork. He couldn't get a job and he qualified in Ireland. And all you could do was go to the UK and uh, join up with the services in those days. And that effectively is what my, pa my father did too with his brothers and his cousins. So they joined the Indian Medical Service. And my father had a very successful career in that game, even though he was in various theatres of war, Middle East, Iran, and uh, Africa, and so on. But he ended up in Burma and Southeast Asia. And he ended up as the director of medical services for the whole of Southeast Asia at the end of the war. And for his services, he was actually given the CBE. So he was very, very highly decorated for his services. Now, when the partition of India took place in 1947, and we discussed that in more detail there, but effectively, can you, you can see my screen okay, can you? Am I yes. Yeah. Because effectively he joined the Pakistan Army Medical Services when the partition took place because he had connections with Jinnah, the first president or governor general of Pakistan. And he was actually physician to Jinnah in Pakistan in the last year or so of his life. So uh, he, he joined up in the military hospital in Quetta. And then we later on returned to Ireland in 1951. He took over his medical, his medical practice in Malangar. 
luckily we just got a telegram out of the blue from my my father's cousin and he said do you want to come and take over the practice otherwise i'd be talking to you from quetta in pakistan <laughs> anyhow the um Unfortunately, my poor dad died very young, age 51, in 1964. He got a brain hemorrhage in the surgery, treating patients. And this is actually just before I entered Trinity. And my mother, uh, Beatrice B, as we called her, she was, um, uh, she was from Dublin. I was born in Bombay in 1945. She nursed, she then joined the nursing service in during the war years and uh, or just before the uh, war years and she nursed in a very dangerous place which was the casualty clearance frontline casualty stations in the Burma war against the Japanese so it was very very tense dangerous work for her. The main thing is we stayed in touch with Dr Holland in Quetta who in fact visited us in 1966 when I was in Trinity as a medical student. And he invited me out sometime. Come on out, we'd love to see you. Yippee, yippee. Little knowing I'd take up his invitation. But basically speaking, I eventually let this simmer gently in the back of my mind. And eventually in 1969, in the last year of my year in college, last academic year, I went uh, for the summer. Now there's Dr. Holland, the man who invited me in the early 1960s. You can see him there with his lovely family, his wife, himself and his daughters and so on. His daughter, I hope, is tuning into this Tristam and um, uh, but she may not with the difficulties of the password. So we, we don't know whether she'll be able to link in or not. But I did give her the links and all that. So um, but she has given me a lot of updated information on the hospital since then. Um, you will notice that she's seated, and that's because she's got polio, the, 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 the Mrs. Holland, Mrs. Joan Holland, and I'll be talking about that later. Now, there are my parents in India. You can see my mother was a pretty glamorous looking lady in a nursing uniform. And that's my father in the background there in the middle and there's the pair of them together in um, 1939. On April the 8th, according to that um, picture there. So it's an idea they're all taken from the family album. But you can see they were a fine pair and then was deeply fond of them, as you can guess. Here is the famous Jinnah, Pakistan, Governor General, first leader of Pakistan. And he died, in fact, in 1948, the year after we arrived in Pakistan, unfortunately. This is the Quetta Medical, Medical Military Hospital where my parents were involved with, and you can see them in the front row there. Uh, that's my father there, and that's my mother. And in fact, there is a dog that we had called Satan. How about that for a name for a dog? Not bad. So after I got this invitation, the question, of course, was, well, there, where's Pakistan? You've got to find it on the map, first of all. And secondly, how do you get there? So the easy way was just to fly, fly to Karachi and take a bus and a train to Quetta and then over. And then, of course, I started thinking, well, you know, wouldn't I miss a lot of scenery on the way if I just flew in? And I thought about it. And I, was like, I want to take the scenic route. I want to have a little look at life on the way. So I got hold of a second-hand Volkswagen variant, station wagon car, and I compared my fellow student. He wasn't a medical student, but he was a... He was in my digs, John Dixon from Belfast, and he, he was, gave me superb support. And in fact, he, we were still talking to, other, after, to each other even after these adventures. So basically speaking, he was my best man some years later. So uh, wonderful support. Maps and routes. Luckily, the, now don't forget, this is all the pre-digital age. There wasn't any information. So basically, luckily, the AA uh, did provide detailed book of maps and commentaries for getting there and so on. And that was very helpful indeed. We couldn't have done it without them. Obviously, we talked about camping equipment and we talked about food and stocks, you know, stuff in the car and carrying with us. And of course, my mother was an invaluable support. She was a wonderful soul. I'm an only child, so I was very close to her. 
And mum, this is an interesting one, my mother said to me, you know, I'm invited to meet some friends in um, Greece. Okay. And it'd be just a small hop, just to hop them. Um, why don't I just hop up to Istanbul and meet you on your way back from Pakistan and we go back together? How about that for a mum? So that's the kind of adventurous soul that she was. And meet me on my turn journey, and uh, you just don't think what could, could possibly happen in between. What could happen, for God's sake? So basically, speaking, that was the kind of concept. And there's, there's the general strategic concept of what we were doing. It's nine countries, about 5,000 miles, give or take. In Europe, of course, you had France, Switzerland, Italy, Yugoslavia, as it was then, and Bulgaria. And then in Asia, you went to Turkey, Iran, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. And that's the main red line route to Pakistan. We did various two detours. I'm still a bit worried about my screen. It's, that's better. We did various detours um, in blue, one up to Afghanistan and one up to Iran and I'll be explaining those later. Now, there's my mum when I was a medical student, very attractive lady still, that's our friend, in fact, that's our rector of Church of Ireland Rector in Mullingar, and that's it. we lived there for a while as well, but that's just essentially my mum, and that's just what she looked like when she saw us off on our journey to Pakistan. And here is the first day, June 1969, my friend, and myself looking very serious and a bit frightened about going at all. I think I'm thinking I'm having second thoughts there, as you can see. But there we are with the car all loaded up and ready to go. And that's in Ballyboden in Dublin. Off we go. So obviously the, the first destination is from Rosslare to France. And France is eight times the size of Ireland with a population of 67 million. And apart from getting in there and then driving across the north of France, as you can see, we went through the north of France and then down to Switzerland. Essentially, one of the interesting spots on the way that I never forgot was Rams Cathedral, which, of course, I'm sure some of you have already done this. If you go inside some of these Gothic cathedrals in France, they are absolutely stunning. And I remember being gobsmacked by the interior of Rams Cathedral. And they're just saying that the whole experience of these wonderful Gothic cathedrals, that's a whole separate literature and discussion on these things. Next session was Switzerland. Switzerland is an extraordinary country because it's the sheer size of it. It's a tiny country. It's only half the size of Ireland, Munster plus, and a population of 8 million, 8.5 million. So again, the, the one need to be aware of the size of the places you're going to. And as the map indicates there, we went down to the Jura Mountains, down to Lausanne, and on down to the Alps into Italy. And there's the Jura Mountains, again, a beautiful section of France and Switzerland, beautiful green hills and green slopes and forests. Then, of course, you've got spectacular Lake Geneva. These are all, most of these are original photographs, so they have faded and disappeared with time. They originally came as slides, and then I converted them to pictures for, for the computer. But you can get a hint of the Don du Midi, which is the wonderful mountain on the south side of Lake Geneva. And then we went through the Great St. Bernard Pass to Italy, 8,000 feet high, only open and then I don't know what the current situation is, from June to September. And if you're interested in history, don't forget that other people have gone through there as well, like Hannibal and Charlemagne and Napoleon. So you've all a few bit of history on your shoulder. Now the next section was just a zip across the north of Italy. There's nothing to stop for, just bomb across the north of Italy into Yugoslavia, into Slovenia and Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia is now all fragmented up into Croatia and Slovenia and Bosnia, Herzegovina, and the whole thing. It was all one big slab of a country then. 
And the idea was we had the one day transit visa for Bulgaria. So the idea was to get down to Bulgaria, but go down the Dubrovnik, down the Dalmatian coast, which is all down here. And it, it's quite an, it's a wonderful trip to go down that way. So effectively then, the, the, the Yugoslavia itself was the Kingdom of the Slavs, Croats, Slovenes in 1918 created after the First World War. And then the Germans invaded it in 1941 and Tito dictated it in, up to the 80s. And then they all split apart in the terrible wars that took place then and created all these subdivisions uh, since and uh, all that stuff. That's all history. We, we've actually been living through that because some terrible things did happen. Now, if you are in near split in northern Yugoslavia, as I remember it, there's an incredible area called the Plit Beecher Lakes. Now, this is taken from the internet, but it's 16 interconnected lakes all pouring into each other by waterfalls. And it, we, we took a drive because the AA guide recommended it. And we took a drive along these 16 lakes just to get the picture of it. So that's what you will see if you go there. It's an incredible, lovely and beautiful vista. So recommend it if you are near that area. Then of course, you've got the Dalmatian coast, hundreds and hundreds of miles of the, you know, the sea on the one side and the huge mountain on the left-hand side, all going down south, the Dalmatian coast road, Mediterranean, you know, Aegean or Mediterranean on the other side. And then we got down to Dubrovnik, which is a beautiful, beautiful red, red roofed bit of uh, town, beautiful stuff there. And then interesting things happened. We continued past Dubrovnik down to Kotor. And Kotor, I don't know what it's called that anymore, but certainly it was then, about 30 miles south of Dubrovnik. And then the road stopped. You couldn't go any further south. I had a vague idea you could sort of drift into Bulgaria along the southern route, but there wasn't anything to go on. So what we what we had to do was turn inland. No more road. Obviously, we couldn't go to Albania because that was extreme communist country, and we were totally banned from going there. So basically, I had to turn in to get to the main road section that from Belgrade to um, to um, Sofia in Bulgaria. So basically we had to get back up inland, had to do a big long trek inland to get there. And I had to turn inland to get down to the direct main road for Bulgaria. So this is Kota itself. In the old days, it used to be a pirate's den because there's an island at the mouth of the harbor there. And the important thing to notice is the road zigzagging all the way up the mountain, left, right, left, right with the hairpin bends all the way up. And you can see it going on. That's an actual photograph of man. Same thing, road going up and up and up. And then you suddenly start finding everything. It's just tiny little shacks, villages, nothing really existing on the inside. And the road disappears onto a potholed road, just gravel and potholes in deep, deep country. So much so that there's not even a bridge across the river. And we had to just sort of find a ford. There seemed to be the indication that there was a ford, which meant the river was there. You were told, and that's all you were told, you were told there's a ford there. In other words, you drove across the water hoping that it really wasn't going to get deep. So that was a bit alarming, but we were able to do that. And lo and behold, we got across this ford and we're back into the deep, deep interior of Yugoslavia, as we understood it then, deep, unpopulated country. Now, eventually we got to Bulgaria, transit visa for Bulgaria, just whiz through. Just one quick comment on the, the, I saw the happiest policeman I have ever seen directing the traffic in the middle of Sofia in Bulgaria. All he did was wave. He didn't stop one lot of traffic, he just waved on the next wave. So it was a great system. Big smile on his face. Come on, lads, your turn. Have a good time. And it was crazy, but it was good fun. He was so happy. 
Now we got to Turkey. As you know, we got to get down over the border. Now we come down to Istanbul, and Istanbul is a big country again. It's um, nine times the size of Ireland and a population of 82 million. Basically, Trace is the very narrow European section, which is just this here. And the rest of it is the Anatolia, which is the whole, which is the main body of Turkey. It's surrounded by three seas, if not four seas, Black Sea, Mediterranean, Aegean, and the Sea of Marmara, which comes up in the chase sometimes. So basically, <coughs> and you've got three or four main cities, Ankara is the main, is the capital, Istanbul, uh, three million, Istanbul, seven million, Izmir, two million. And there's a central planet plateau in the middle here, but uh, Highland in the east, and we have to go over those. You'll notice that the famous Euphrates, which is in the Bible, which splits into the Tigris and the Euphrates, you, that all, um, you know, is in there too. And the coast, of course, I've already mentioned those. Turkey itself <coughs> is uh, three language, Kurdish is there, Arabic is there, the real is Muslim, Sunni, some 1% Orthodox Christian, very ancient history, way back to Troy and Cyrus and the Crusade, and then the Ottoman Empire took it over in, in the 14th century, right up to 19th to the 20th century. It's a nasty history. There was one and a half million Christians were massacred in Armenia in 1915 by the Turks, which is a pretty grim, grim history, which has never been resolved yet. Um, Mustafa Kemal was the famous man who tried to reform the Turkish system post First World War. And since then, they kind of stumbled between democracy and a military dictatorship and back to democracy again. So basically speaking, it's all stumbling away. Uh, Erdogan is no saint, I think, but I just basically, he faintly on the side of democracy, but most of his time he's beating people up and chasing them around. Turkey, Istanbul, of course, is spectacular. I'm looking at the Bosporus there, which is separating Europe from, from Asia. And of course, mosque, there's a mosque, there's a mosque scene there. The usual contrast in any big city like that, a lot of mud shacks in the bottom down here with people living in squalor against some luxury flats in the background. And that stuck me even then. Blue Mosque, of course, is one of the most famous mosques He's the most famous mosque there in, the, in Istanbul. And this one got me intensely. I've got these pictures from the internet because I didn't want to be able to find the ones that I took of it. But it's Hagia Sophia, it was built in one of the largest Eastern church in the sixth century. It was a museum when we went there, but it's now a mosque again. We are now completely transformed into a mosque, which is a pity because I think in a museum state, it made the Christian Christian um, relics and stuff stand out very strongly. The, um, that's the interior, the spectacular interior, domes and beautiful stuff there, and more domes and more stuff. So I'm just saying these are spectacular. It's a gobsmacking place to go into and to get a glimpse of. Then we went on to Ankara. And uh, John knew some friends there, so we stayed the night with them. This is just ourselves waking up in the morning, thinking about the next stage of the journey. That's John there. And um, off we go again. Now, Bernard, are you stuck for time? It's 8 o'clock now. Do you want to break? Um, I'd say, Tim, if we gave people a 10-minute break, it would give you a chance as well to um, rest your vocal cords, maybe. And, you know, if people want to use the toilet or anything, you know. Okay, so we do want to break for about five minutes. Uh, I, I'd say 10 minutes and people can stay on the screen and turn their camera off or they can chat away or whatever. That's okay. what people and usually I'm, do. I'm taking a quick break myself too. I'll be yep. back. So we'll have a 10 day. minute break, but anyone who wants to chat away there, you know, Tim? That's day, Tim. Yeah. And by the way, I'm delighted to see good friends and relations of mine on the screen anyway. So lovely to see you. Welcome. <coughs> It would have been better if Tim had minimized the screen, but anyway, it would be too complicated, maybe, you know. You got in all right, Tim, anyway, and Phil.
Uh, you're muted there, Tim. Well, that's been really fascinating so far anyway. It's been uh, yeah. intriguing. It was very good. Now, at the beginning, he said that he couldn't bear looking at all of us. <laughs> and, you know, I had to look at myself, and I hope you're not offended, but you are very hard to look at. <laughs> Thank you, Tim. Thank you. <laughs> oh, sorry. I was just there... myself. <laughs> Is there any chance that we could return the compliment, Tim? <laughs> I think you just have. <laughs> oh, maybe I have, yeah. Nice, nice to see you at long last, Tim. This is Kevin Goggin. Hello, Kevin. How are you? I'm great, thank you very much. You're looking great anyway. And all the better for seeing you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Clue, did your brother come on at all, do you know? Gwynper? We can't hear you at all, Claude. Garnison. Oh, that's Garnison. Mm. Oh, all right. Yeah, I, I, I'm on bird. A really good talk. Oh, you're there. Oh, you're there. I, I was wondering. Yeah, yeah. That's great that you're there, Gwynver. Brilliant. <laughs> yeah. Very, very Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. One roll. Can you see other people there now, or are we just looking at a Tim screen? Well, we can only see about a half a dozen. It would have been better if Tim had stopped the share, but then it might be a bit complicated for him getting back on again, you know? I, I can just see this, the share screen. Oh, no, maybe I can change. If you go into no. gallery view, go into gallery view, and you'll be able to see a half a dozen there. Can only see the good looking group. <laughs> no. <laughs> no I... It's not happening, but sure. I nearly know what you all look like, don't I? <laughs> <laughs> like Tim said, we're hard to look at. <laughs> That's why I was glad when he started showing photographs. <laughs> and you said, hey, That's a nice house. <laughs> I've seen on TV, I think. <laughs> Imagine if you did that trip again now, wouldn't, wouldn't the countries look so different? Yeah. The figures Tim was giving us there about um, populations, uh, that, uh, are they of current populations, I wonder, as against uh, the time he was traveling? I expect, uh, I expect them. You expect their current populations, yeah. Oh. Are you on cameras or anything? Mine. No, my camera is on, but I, I, it's showing black. But it, it, I have it on. I have the button is on. Okay. Why? Why that is? I don't know. I can see Pat, and I can see myself. I'm down the ground, of course. No, I, I can see Bernard. And I can see as I go along there, but my own screen is black yeah. for whatever yeah. reason. But it's it's not it's not blocked out. Yeah. On the system, like that's blocked out now, and there's a, just a blank picture. But if I take that off, and I'm not sitting in the dark, so I don't know why that is. I'm on different. You mean blacklisted, Harry? I mean that looks like this. Yeah, yeah, looks like that. What a suggestion there. I'm not there on there as much excitement up in Coolmore with a mayor falling down where he is starting off here. <laughs> uh, there's more fun here though, John. Well, I know that. At 150 to 1, John. Yeah. Where are we The bookies are all gone away on holidays. Aha, mm -hmm. uh -huh. I press the button there. Yeah, you Don't yeah. all clap together now. You're, <laughs> <laughs> You're back on again. I'm back on. I pressed a little button up on top. I don't know what it said, but it, uh, it brought me back into view anyway. Gallery view. Uh, yeah. And you don't look a day older, Harry. No, I must the same, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> must the same. Isn't it great to have daylight outside? Isn't it fantastic? Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. And today was a cold day. I think that this morning I looked at something there and it was showing three degrees. 
Yeah. At about about nine o'clock this morning. Well, we've escaped lucky because we're supposed to have the cold and the frost from Sunday lunchtime. But it heated up in the afternoon. Yeah. I was out in the garden there at like four o'clock and it was quite warm. Yeah, it's quite. Nice. But once 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 the sun was shining, you were grand. But if you went in out, if you, if, you, if you you know went from sun into oh, just it was it was cool it was cool out there. Just... It was yeah yeah. Like you're grand if you were doing something out there, but you wouldn't go. You wouldn't go out and sit down outside now and read a book or anything, you know. Be grand inside, inside the last screen. Yeah. Were you swimming, no Harry? No torch. I was. Yeah. Jeez, imagine. I was in it today, but and actually, it's, it's it's amazing. You go over to Sandy Cove there. I'd say there was at least. I was there about two o'clock, and there was at least fifteen in the water at that stage. Gee. Yeah. No, the, the water was nice, but the, it was cool enough getting in today, just walking into it. Right. <coughs> wouldn't need any more penance than that. No, no, it's not a penance really. Once you, you know, I think the body kind of gets used to it as well, you know. Um, yeah. You tell yourself to treat yourself anyway. <laughs> Mind over matter. Whenever you're ready, I suppose, Tim. Okay. Was it was it Matt Talbot in Dublin who used to um, uh, tie himself up with nails right, under his vests yeah. and things? It seems to me like that's a lesser punishment. Than going into the into the sea at Sandy Cove every day, Harry. But you know, maybe you're right. Maybe you get used to it. Yes, you're saying thing I say. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, right, Tim. Whenever you're ready, so Tim, we'll get going again. Right, then we continue. Just I just remembered when I took my break that I should have mentioned also that my cousins, the Jacksons cousins, that's my father's brother's children, were also born out in India. And they showed an interest in getting back there. And they left by the same time as me, roughly. And uh, that was Peter and Susan, his sister. And they took off for India overland, but by uh, various public transport routes. So they eventually got to India. And she, she's, a, she's a, a recognized author now, but she lives in Canada. But she, she eventually went on all the way to our ancestral home, some great uncles of ours ended up in Argentina, and she eventually found they ended up in Argentina and effectively went around the world in that same year. So there, there seems to be a, a genetic um, compulsion to travel in our family, I must say. So there you are, just warning you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, don't get connected with us in other words. <laughs> now, this is Turkey near Ankara capital city. And again, we're heading up towards the Black Sea, but you can see we've got a perfectly good road, quite civilized looking country, and uh, things are going to change, I promise you. And it's changed me now, sorry very much. And now we're talking about Eastern Turkey. We're going from Ankara to Samsun and along the Black Sea coast to Trabzon. We had a swim somewhere in the Black Sea, beautiful fresh water, beautiful water beautiful place, and then on to Trabzon, and then down now. Do you remember we're trying to get to Iran over here? So on down over the mountains to Azurum, and on into what is now the edge of Azerbaijan, then that area, but just um, on into Iran. So that's the route we were taking now. And just to give you an idea of what's going on. That wasn't taken when we were there, but I'm just illustrating it. I just found it online. I was just intrigued by the fact there's the main road back here. You can see that this is an airport between the main road and the sea, Black Sea. And this is in a cutting that was in the newspaper. But I couldn't resist taking a photo of it, or downloading it, because the plane skidded off the runway, but didn't end up in the sea and everybody was okay. Mm -hmm. You can see the geography okay. the place there, a city, 
and then basically a road, and then in this case, an airport there, but the, the airport wasn't there in our day, but it just illustrates the proximity of the Black Sea to the cities. And then back into Eastern, Eastern Turkey, and again, things are getting a little more rural, um, more rural and um, cottages and buildings are all nothing like the cities. And here we are in the passes, the high mountains now, high passes, more high passes, more the steep drops off the road down there. You wouldn't want to go off the road here. So basically, you can see that the things are getting quite interesting. And then things, then the road surface disappeared. And we got a gravel road with lots and lots of dust. And the real problem with the dust is you notice the lorries down there with a huge cloud of dust behind them. So the technique for overtaking is basically you cannot see anything when you're close to the lorry. You drop back half a mile and you squint up the road and you say, nothing's coming, let's go. And you hope to God nothing is going to come during the time you're going through the dust. So you're basically blazing through the dust. Mind you, the, the Turks were very happy, go lucky people too. I remember we overtook some people on an ordinary road once and they waved a drink at it, or not a drink, but whatever it was, some tasty morsel from the lorry at us. And we slowed down and they passed us. And as they passed us, we kept pace with them and they handed over this tasty morsel through the window at us. So it was great fun, we were great guests, great people. So I'm just saying these silly things happen, but the main thing is to remember the technique for passing lorries in the dust, just drop back half a mile, see if nothing's coming, and then hoping nothing is coming when you're coming through the dust. And there you get is more stuff. It's becoming very dry, very arid, very bare. And here's the road itself. You can see the surface that we're now driving on. And this is east of them. And now we decided to camp off that road up on the side there. We took out the camp beds and slept there overnight because we were pretty tired. And basically, all night long, the lorries tooted the horn at us, said, Hi, folks, having a good time? Beep, beep. Sweet old sleep, could you get with that? But anyhow, we got some sleep. So we woke up in the morning wondering, What the hell are we doing here? Where, where are we? And round the corner, we get to Mount Ararat. Now, that's my original photograph. It's very vague. You could vaguely see the same, but it happens to be 18,000 feet high, the highest thing in the area. So it's the right place for Noah to land his ark on, just to let you know. So um, it's the highest mountain in the zone, and it is mentioned in the Bible as where Noah is put his ark down. Now, this is again not a view of my I did all original pictures, but it is spectacularly beautiful, extraordinary sight, believe me. Now, east, when we got to the Iran border, east of the Turkish border, we started descending from a fairly high altitude section to the desert. And boy, the temperature started rising 30 plus, 35 whatever it was in today's terms, we started to feel the heat very, very intensely. And so we come into Iran, and again, it's nearly 20 times the size of Ireland, with a population of 80 million, and there's big cities in it. There's Tehran in the north central, and there's Mass Shed, which is a sacred city in this area, two million, and then there's Tabriz, somewhere else that I've forgotten where it's up here when we passed through it and when we entered the place. And then there's Shiraz down in the middle section down here. Some of you may have seen uh, a wonderful documentary on the Silk Road by Joanna Lumley and there's lovely sections and shots of Iran in that documentary. So I very recommend it. And as I say, the plateau with the, a big plateau in the middle with deserts, there's mountains <coughs> in the north up here, there's the Zagras Mountains in the west, and then of course, this section of Afghanistan and everything is more mountains, and Pakistan is tucked away down here.
Now we're going by the northern route into Afghanistan. What well, a few comments about uh, Iran, its language, its Farsi, its Kurdish and Baluchi and Turk, they're all linked up there. It's a Shia Muslim and it linked up very strongly with Arabia. And there's been one or two documentaries about the way they're squeezing Syria and the Middle East to get the maximum out of the situation. The Muslims seem to have 75% of the world's oil and 45% of the world's gas. So they, yeah, that's where they're getting their resources uh, very intensely centered that way. The very ancient civilization 3000 years ago and apparently they invented medicine, they invented the post, they invented the bank check, the calculator, the algebra, trigonometry, batteries, carrots, tulips, roses, stained glass, polo and chess. So that's quite a good list, just to let you know. In 1930s, the Shah of Persia visited Germany and was persuaded by Hitler to change the name from Persia to Iran, which is effectively the Aryans, because you can only be a good Aryan, according to Hitler. I think that's as good. Iran was occupied in the 1935 by the Allies to try and prevent to protect the oil. Oil, of course, the oil industry was there and they wanted to try and protect the invasion from the Germans, so it was occupied during the war. And the ruling Shah, 10 years after I passed through and left, was ousted, and it's been an Islamic Republic since. And a pretty, it was fairly, pretty extreme in Shah's day as well, with a secret police who, if they thought wrong of you, would whip you into prison and beat you up. And the Islamic Republic is still a pretty strong extreme sense. They've had an eight-year war with Iraq, with Saddam Hussein, and there's the usual uranium for nuclear weapons, the US treaty, which Trump stopped, and now they're trying to start it up again with Biden and so on and so forth. So here is the eastern road south of Meshed. And a couple of things happened first here. First of all, we were driving through the intense, busy traffic in, in Tehran itself. And lo and behold, somebody left the manhole off. The cover of the manhole was left off. And we went slap bang into the manhole and stopped dead. And the traffic all divided all around us. And luckily, and I, I did, I, I'm always amazed by the generosity and help that you get when spontaneous things like that happen. Because immediately about a dozen people came over to us and lifted us out of the manhole in the middle of the traffic. Now, would you see that happening here? Double, little, even little cork? I don't know, but I'm just saying it's a sheer generosity and you know interaction of people when something goes wrong, they do try to help, and we were very touched by that. So we rattled on into Tehran, we went on out the road according to the map I had, and suddenly I noticed that everything was looked very wrong. We were actually on the wrong road. We had taken the wrong turn. And we were three hours down this road before we realized, you know, this isn't quite the right turn. But we worked out that where this is going to eventually get join up to where we want anyway. What the hell? It's going to Afghanistan, it's going east. And it was very dusty, as you can see, and a very corrugated road. Now, any of you who've driven in those circumstances know that you can only semi-controlled driving. In other words, you can either go very slow or down, you know, you just go up and down, up and down, or you go very fast and you go through a shock wave where the passenger has to hold the gear lever in place. That's how shocking it is. And then eventually, suddenly you, suddenly you are lightly skipping from crest to crest of the ridges, lightly, very lightly. And you're whizzing along at 60 miles an hour with damn all control of the car. But you have to get there. So it's the only way of driving. So basically, there we are, skimming along from crest to crest, having a great time, yippee yippee. On this very dusty road, same old thing, lorries and dust and having to drop back and pass them and all that stuff. And this was a beautiful oasis, Neshapur, the tomb of Omar Khayyam, you know, the wonderful poem by Omar Khayyam, uh, a Persian poet. Beautiful stuff, translated well by Edward Fitzgerald and uh, it's one of my favorite poems anyway, it's a beautiful piece. 
So um, I'm just saying we were the bliss to get into this place, this an oasis in the middle of this desert, and to have a melon or two there and sit back and soak up this beautiful place there. Now things start to happen. If you've been bored up to now, please wake up now, because this is where things start happening. We camped with Germans. The great thing about those days was everybody was traveling, everybody was, you met people, you chatted with people. And lo and behold, with a nice big Land Rover with Germans in it, and we had a nice chat with them south of, south of my shed, about, about 50, 60 miles from the border. And we camped with them, and we I ate some tinned food that we'd got somewhere, I forget where they were. And in the morning, guess who? Muggins, myself, got intense food poisoning intense diarrhea, I certainly wasn't able to drive, and my good friend John took over. Our usual routine was two hours off and on, that's the way we used to do, you know, the driving. So I'm just saying that was the John took over. And then near the border, we were whizzing along in the way I've told you about, skimming lightly from crest to crest, and a lorry stopped in front of us. A good half mile, quarter of a mile away. And we braked and sweet all happened, nothing happened. And you we went slamming into the lorry, halfway under the lorry. Windscreen smashed and just jammed under the lorry. And we were very lucky because the Danish jeep behind us did disentangle us, put a tow rope on us and pulled us out. People in the lorry just jabbed at us. They weren't damaged, we were, but they just jabbed at us in a language I couldn't understand, and they just drove off. So that was essentially the situation there. So we only had 800 miles, about a thousand miles left without the windscreen and plenty of dust and insects, everything coming through the window at us. In fact, when we looked, when we got to the end of the journey, and looked in the back of the car, it was crawling with bugs and mosquitoes and various creatures that had come in through the windscreen. And it was all in the back of the car collecting. So if you had a good hoover that collects insects, that was our machine. So essentially our problem was getting back to, getting on to Pakistan, we got to the border. The incident happened at Tayyibat, which is here. And then we went on to here that to a garage which managed to push up the roof for us so we could actually look out properly because the roof had actually come down to about six inches above the bonnet. That's how low the roof was. And so luckily we got that prized up there, but they didn't have a windscreen or anything for us. So basically we just kept, and then we just went, kept going after that down to Dilaram and on to Kandahar. And these are all famous names now for the political reasons. And then on to Chaman, which is the first town in Pakistan, and on to Quetta. Only about a thousand miles in one day. So it's a long section of stuff to go through. So here I am, the day of arrival in Quetta. You can see the cars looking a bit dented. You can see I'm looking a little bit dented too. I mean, basically I was looking very faded and worn after all my couple of days, my full day of diarrhea. So there. But luckily, I have survived. And the car survived. John has survived. So we're all okay. So here we are, Pakistan. It's nearly 10 times the size of Ireland, 216 million people there. It's got huge populations of cities, 5 million in Karachi, 3 million in Lahore, Islam, man. And basically you have the northern mountains up here, the Hindu Kush all around here, and then the Karakoram. Then you've got the big Indus River Plain, it's right down the middle of Pakistan. And then you've got the Baluchistan Desert, which is the, um, some people fairly better know Baluchistan, but I, I, I use Baluchistan. Um, but basically, Quetta is the capital of that. And essentially, you can see how big Baluchistan is geographically. It's about 40% of the size of Pakistan. Now, Pakistan itself means the land of the pure. So if you want to find nice, pure people, go to Pakistan. It will be here. 
huge complexity of languages, Punjabi, Sindhi, Pashti, Pushtu, Urdu. I was fluent in Urdu when I was a child, and I hoped that something a little trigger would um, spark it off again when I went back there, but nothing happened. 206, 200 billion people, but they're mainly in the Indus Bay in the river going down the middle. Sorry, go to the one, please. The religion is Muslim Sunni and uh, Shia, very extreme in various places. There's a death penalty for the um, uh, last 30 years, there's been a death penalty. There was a Christian woman jailed in, in the place in recent years. Basically, Hindu, the history is very conflicted and difficult. Independence from Britain was India, but Jinnah. Gandhi and Nehru could not agree on how to make it properly. Jinnah wanted devolved areas within the Indian subcontinent, some degree of development of authority to Muslim areas, but the Indian Congress party, Nehru and co would not allow this. So Jinnah said, listen, if you won't do this, we'll have to have a separate country completely from you. So eventually, effectively, they set up partition, East and West partition, East and West Pakistan were created as Muslim countries separate from India. And all accounts state that this was a dreadfully hasty and botched business. Mount Batten was expected to sort out the thing in a few months, and it was a mess, a very nasty mess. And a real lesson in necessary because it's very frightening what happened. 14 million people were displaced by religion, uh, and up to 2 million people killed each other. They were all crawling all over the place. I remember one of my childhood memories of when we moved in 47, 1947 to Pakistan. I remember being on a train guarded by troops, because the trains had to be guarded by troops. And I remember all the soldiers sitting on the roof, and this little childhood memory of a three-year-old child, or, uh, of the legs of the troops hanging over the train window. And that's, what I, that's the view I had, uh, a forest of legs looked on the top half of the window. So basically speaking, it goes on, basically speaking, uh, Bangladesh itself became, uh, East Pakistan eventually started to become Bangladesh itself. The constant dispute in India over Kashmir and other territories, nuclear weapons, and in recent years, a very strong Taliban influence, especially near the Afghan border. So it's a very, uh, become a very polarized and difficult part of the world. It's also an earthquake zone, which is extremely worrying. And um, I'm getting this. Right, sorry, but I'm in the wrong place here. Um, like a second. Yes, it's in a serious earthquake area. Apparently, there are three the Indian, Eurasian, and Arabian plates are all squeezing over, squeezing over each other and grinding into each other about two inches a year. That big movement, geologically speaking. And in 1935, there was an enormous earthquake in Quetta itself, where 35,000 people were killed. In 2005, in recent years, again, there was a huge earthquake in Pakistan and Kashmir and 100,000 were killed. So it is an earthquake zone. Now, Quetta itself is the provincial capital of Baluchistan. It's Baluchistan, as I said, is a 45% 45% of the area of Pakistan, a huge desert area, and it's 6% of the population. One million population about, but it's decreased recently due to conflicts. The altitude is high, 6,000 feet nearly. It's a semi-arid climate, hot, dry summers and cold winters. I even remember as a child crying over the fact that my snowman was melting a snowman couldn't melt. I loved my snowman. How could you do this to me? So basically, I remember as a child with this wonderful snow and snowman and everything, and eventually the sun comes and my snowman melts. Hot and essentially drought episodes. When we arrived, they were just about to evacuate Quetta 
because of the extreme drought that they'd experienced. They would go, if they didn't get rain in the next 10 days, they would have to evacuate. You could only have the taps on twice a day and the water was kept in the bath and that sort of stuff. Luckily, the rain did come the following week, so we didn't have to evacuate. It's a strategic location close to the Afghan border. Now, this is a highly recommended book for you, Declan Walsh, The Nine Lives of Pakistan. I came across it recently, and it's a very disturbing. It is a, he's a Northern Ireland journalist, I think. No, he's, yeah, I can't remember where he's from, but he, uh, a wonderful, uh, uh, no, he's not, he's a concerned man, I'm not sure he is, but Declan Walsh, anyway, he wrote The Nine Lives of Pakistan and it's a disturbing recent account of the division and conflict in Pakistan and especially Balochistan, Makweta is. So it's worth reading and realizing how divided and difficult the place is. Now here's the famous road. I have on my screen a nasty yellow streak and the hunter came, I, I can't get rid of it, but that's, uh, those streaks shouldn't be there. Sorry about that. Um, in Quetta, this is the famous road leading north into the mountains in Afghanistan. So that's the Quetta is where I'm looking from north to Afghanistan and that's the chairman is on the border about 30 or 40, 50 miles north up there. One interesting little point that my mother mentioned to me said that she was talking to a man who had survived the terrible earthquake in the 30, 1935. And um, he said that he saw the moon rising over the peak of this mountain, okay? And then suddenly, the whole mountain moved up to meet the moon, the moon disappeared. And that was actually the beginning of the earthquake. It was big enough to displace a mountain up to block the moon. It was rising over it and then it went back down again. So it just shows you how terrifying this wave of geological wave hitting the country must have been. This is just a street scene in Quetta, full of camels, camel train. This is the big military fort there. <clears throat> now, this is where I went to work, Quetta Mission Hospital, a lovely place. And it was founded in 1887 and was rebuilt after it was destroyed by the 35 earthquake. Dr. Sutton founded it, Dr. Thomas Hayes, and then the two Hollands, Dr. Sir Henry Holland, or Dr. Henry Holland, as he was then, he was knighted for his work and Dr. Ronnie Holland, who is the man who invited me out. And they all kept this place going. If you can, it's out of print, but if you can, try and get a copy. I've actually lost my copy. If one of you has it, please give it back to me. But basically, it's, big, uh, it's Sir Henry Holland's book is called Frontier Doctor, and it's a wonderful book about his work in the hospital and all the different things they were trying to do. It's a complex area. There's Bahui upland, there's Baluchi foothills, there's Bhutan's in and out, Sindhi and Punjabi in the plains. And all these guys are moving around. In other words, in the winter, they move south because it's too cold in Quetta. And in the summer, they all come back and say, hi, lads, we're back. So that's with a huge drift of population, certainly in those days. There was also a multiplicity of language. There was Urdu and Farsi and Baluchi and Bahui and Pushtu and Sindhi. So you have to be a polyglot to live there and survive. Now, the hospital itself had medical and obstetric teams. I worked mainly in the medical and surgical side. And basically, we saw ophthalmic stuff, we got a huge amount of cataracts. And we often go off for a week in some far off town and be for, for a whole solid week there in a far off town just doing cataracts. Because, in fact, they were more prone to cataracts in the desert heat and sand. I think they were more prone to cataracts than they are here because of the extremes of climate. Trachoma, again, is a form of infection of the eye, and we were able to treat that too. Infections, a lot of stuff there, malaria was there, was endemic, PTB, dysentery, and typhoid. And then, of course, surgery, we had a lot of trauma going on there, burn. 
Unfortunately, you are sometimes you had epileptics who were sitting by the campfire and fell into the campfire and got badly burnt because of that. And you had fractured, lots of fractures, you had cancers. And we had one, extra, one extraordinary case that still sits in my mind, the fellow hobbling on his crutch 100 miles from Afghanistan on his crutch because he had been bitten in the left leg by a snake and the whole leg had withered away by gangrene from the knee down. All he had was a skeleton there. And his poor soul stumbled into us, asking us for help. All we could do was tidy it up and give him some support, splints and other things, just to keep the show going, but and amputate the leg at the knee or something like that. But it was a right mess. I mean, we were terribly struck by it. And a lot of abscesses and TB abscesses and amoebic abscesses. And our system of anesthesia for the surgery was, I forget the actual technical reasons, but we couldn't use the standard gas cylinders for, uh, that we use over here. And we're so used to, partly because of the altitude, but partly because of uh, availability. And essentially all we could do then was essentially give local anesthetics, spinal anesthetics, or ether masks for general anesthetic. That's the way we would do it then. Now, its current situation, I've included this a little bit because I've been in touch with Tristam Holland, who is the daughter of the Hollands. And I get emailed updates from her. And it is supported by a charity, Friends of Quetta Hospital. And they are hanging on by their fingernails trying to keep going. So they need funds. Give a talk to them, lads. Please donate if you can. They do need funds. I have made my contribution in time a couple of years ago, and I will do so again. So friends of credit hospital.org is the website. Um, <clears throat> the big thing is Taliban extremism is now very prevalent in the region. Christians did a no-no thing, and apparently the recent bombing of a Methodist church in recent years, but it is free a lot of violence going on. So they're only able to get the place staffed now by Muslim doctors, not like in my day. And if they can keep the key clinics done, we can't get surgeons because lower pay and no pensions compared with the government hospital. Now the latest, I bullet point the latest points from, <coughs> from Tristam. And she's saying, hardly recognize the hospital now, but it is doing its best under tough conditions. No one seems to work and want to work in Quetta this day when it's become a real frontier town, no foreigners for years. Um, it's difficult to find doctors, especially male doctors of any quality. Some it's all, always army wives who have been trained as doctors move to Quetta with their husband and they, all, they supply services. But they do seem to love working at Christian Hospital for its standards and ethics. No bribery, no lies, minimal fees for the poor, equal respect shown to rich and poor, just as you would remember, is what she said to me. And it was a wonderful feeling and standard for the place that you would care. And it an outstanding, outstanding reputation for obstetrics. And at the moment, the Pakistani doctor in charge and his doctor wife are saintly people, they're wonderful people. But I was from Tristram Holland just the other day. I got that update from her. So here's the scene that I saw it there. Big courtyard and the families come with their patients. And when you might be looking at the patient in a hospital bed, but the families are out there supporting them with their meals, etc., and general needs. So that's the way to do things. Tell the HSE that. They'd love that, wouldn't they? We could all crowd in and give to give our favorite meal to the patient. But yes, they would give wonderful support to their to their loved ones trying to keep them going. And they would hang around the courtyard like I've shown. There's the wall, open air wall. Obviously, in the summer it could be like that. In the winter it couldn't be like that. There's a hookah, a hobble bubble, and you can put whatever you like in that. I was told it was hash or tobacco, but God knows what you could put into it. Nowadays, you'll be putting heroin and cocaine and all the other exciting things in it now. 
But in those days, it was just hash and tobacco in those days. Now, here is the outpatient's desk. And you can see how crowded it was. There was very little privacy. For a clinical examination, you did go behind the per curtains. But for interrogation and chat and questioning, you just stood there at the desk and you, you answered the questions and you gave your statements and everybody else listening in. So what if you happen if you say, listen, I'm very scared of going to join the male shed and I'm very worried about the leverage. Everybody else would be listening to you, to your phobias and your worries. So uh, that's the reality of the situation. 50 people are all crowded into the one room, all listening to you. But it was, there was no luxury scene. There they are all sitting around on the floor on chairs, if there are any chairs available. And that's the scene. But it was still a very efficient we got through our patients, we got through the people, and it was very efficiently run. This is a sad one because this is a poor man with a, believe in an ulcerating breast cancer of the male. But you can see the chloroph the, the ether anesthesia that the nurse is using there too. But you can see how grim the situation is for, for some people. Now, we'd be turning out to the patients there, but the weekends we often had a nice break and we would go off about 50 miles up the road to a place called Ziarat. And the Governor General himself had a big house in Ziarat area as well. And was also on the famous route, the highway to India that Alexander the Great get. Great. And I'm always conscious of who's been on this road before with me. And there was Alexander looking over my shoulder on the way to India. So I'm just saying, be aware of who's been marching down these roads, wild, deserty country. And here we are in the out itself. There's a nice country house here. And this is our said there. There's um, John Dixon, still smiling, still laughing. There's Tim Holland. There is Dr. Holland himself. That's the administrator of the hospital. Mustafa, I think I've forgotten his um, name, but he, and there's uh, Ronnie Holland there. And that's his good wife, seated, as I've said, because of her history of polio. Now, this is the case history from Frontier Doctor. This is about her, and this is what happened to her. And you think about what they did to keep her going. He was in working in Kashmir, in way up in the north of Kashmir, then in 1941, in Srinagar Mission Hospital. And suddenly she developed a high fever, polio, and it just so happened she also had a little two-month-old baby at the time as well. And suddenly she goes into complete paralysis of the lungs. She can't breathe and no breathing. So they start artificial respiration for her out in the wilds up there in the north of Pakistan, relays of workers. And then they try and find out where is the nearest iron lung to keep this lady going. And they hear from the state hospital that the iron lung is out of fraction and the bellows has burst. So what he does, just think of how, how resourceful he is, that I'll give you the inner tube of a tire. I'm sending you just ahead of us to fix that bellows. You better get it fixed and we'll follow and keep the wife going with artificial respiration. So we're talking about a 50 mile trip on the back of a lorry. So basically she's in the back of the lorry with continuous artificial respiration all the way on the journey to the hospital. And the iron lung is fixed by the time they got there, they got it working and they got her to recover her breath. And she survived. He ended up with one arm and one leg, paralyzed, but continued her professional life as an anesthetic nurse in the hospital. And by the way, she just had two more children as well. What the hell? So I'm just saying, that's some story. That's an extreme survival game. And yet they had the resources. With the limited resources they had, they were still able to keep her going. I think it's a marvelous story to illustrate the kind of people I worked with. That's the forest, and I still have that painting in my kitchen. It was a painting given to my mother, and essentially it's the juniper forest in Ziarat, 
and the beautiful scent of juniper, juniper all around you there, you can scent the, juniper, the beautiful scent and it feels lovely and it's relatively cool compared with the heat of the plains. And that's just a picture of a tribesman walking down with his herd. And this is actually ourselves camping in this area and having a nice barbecue and things. That he is settling his wife into his chair over there. And then we hear ourselves, myself, John Dixon, and Tim Holland, the son. He has now gone on to become a fellow of the Royal Society in the field of geology. So he's a pretty intelligent guy and has done very well. So I'm just saying, we lovely company, lovely chat, and this is ourselves camping and taking the day off and having a good time. There's an interesting little story attached to this. This is a wadi entrance, it's a dried up riverbed, and you can just go in and you can go in and it gets narrower and narrower. And the story told to us is these places are prone to flash floods. And essentially the story told is that um, Sir Henry Holland was in this wadi and essentially there it is, drier than anything like that. And they were looking at thunder of lightning over in the hills in the distance. What could I, that looks a good distance away, what's the problem? And then about an hour or two later, he was in this wadi itself and suddenly heard water roaring through the channel. And he managed to shin up the side here, up to about, about the side, about the right there, and managed to avoid the walling wall of water that passed through this wadi. So flash floods can happen in these areas and they're quite dangerous. So I'm just saying, they're very dangerous. You want to watch your climate around you. This is one little adventure that we had. We decided to climb a mountain one weekend. This is Khalifat Mountain. It's only 11,500 feet high. And by dint of much pulling and pushing, and I think they were about to give up with me, but eventually they dragged me to the top of the mountain. So I can still say that I've climbed a mountain that is about three times the size of Karen Tool. So I've got that to my credit. Evidence photographs. So there you are. Fantastic day, fantastic stuff we did there. And this is a village in the area of Yarrett Village. And we used to hold clinics in these places, see about 50 patients in that place, try and sort them out, spent the day doing that sort of stuff. And then at the end of the day, the villagers would reward us with a feast in the evening, all sitting on the floor with the meals out in front of you and great conversation and chat and burn how me. Lovely stuff. But we're lovely people. And this is the kind of scene that we had there. Now, here's your summer interlude coming up now. John, believe it or not, heard, this is before the internet, of course, you couldn't do anything in those days. You could only physically phone now and then. But basically he heard that he had to return to repeat the exams. And maybe we better best fly back from Afghanistan and Kabul over the border. And by the way, windscreen, we still haven't got a windscreen. Windscreens were cheaper in Afghanistan. It cost me a thousand pounds to get a windscreen in Pakistan. Well, I can get one for 60, 60 pounds or something in Afghanistan. So I'm just saying it, it made sense. So we, the idea was we would drive to Kabul to get the windscreen and we got the windscreen there. And then we drove north into Hindu Kush territory, way up to the Russian border, which was the Russian border in those days. And then I, after the trip up way up north there, I left John in Kabul. And while he was waiting for his plane, he explained experience an earthquake, luckily an only sm a small earthquake, but the room was shaking. He said it was quite scary. And then I returned for a few more weeks work in Quetta. So there we are. Afghanistan itself is about 20 times the size of Ireland, 40 million population. The main city is Kabul. And then you've got Kandahar in the south. And here that is where we came in from the from, from um, Iran over here. And basically uh, <coughs> the um, it's the central highlands here, which are pretty high, and you've got a little snatch of northern plains and the southwest plateau. 
But it's all very hard to shoot stuff there. It's about all over, well over 3,000, 5,000 feet up, so it's quite hard. So off we go into Afghanistan. <coughs> it's Farsi and Pushtu, it's Muslim, it's sunny, it's the crossroads of Asia, tribal, monarchy overthrown. Then the Soviets marched in, in 10 years after we were there and occupied it. And then there was nothing but guerrilla warfare and extremist groups, especially encouraged by the CIA, including the Taliban and so on. So I'm just saying all this was happening and post 9 and essentially the US Al Qaeda, Al Qaeda attack and the Taliban situation. And it's still an unstable government. And indeed, the Taliban are a very, very major threat to continuing in this place. Here we are on the road. Note there's no windscreen in front of us. We're just taking photographs directly to the windscreen. And you can see how crowded the buses are on. Just hop on the back of the bus, no trouble. No, no trouble at all. Belt allowed at 60 miles an hour. But there you are, wave you get us having a good time. In Kabul itself, you can feed the monkeys off in the tree there. There we are, off we go mostly to the monkeys, snatching it from us. Beautiful city, beautiful place. What is terrible about this whole implications of all this is in our time, it was a peaceful area and a peaceful place. And the dreadful polarities that have emerged since then were not evident. So here's north of Kabul, a little village. You can see the usual scene, a village in the corner here. Oh, and then you can see the river fire running by. And it just illustrates the kind of geographical terrain. Villages are often built like a fortress to protect them for defense. Here's the highest tunnel in the world at the time. The Colorado Rockies have beaten it by 100 foot since. But it's nearly 11,000 feet through the Hindu Kush mountains, the Lang Tunnel. What was interesting was outside is bright sunshine, quite warm. Inside, freezing cold, absolutely shockingly cold when you suddenly went into this tunnel because no light, no heat. So I was amazed at the contrast when you went into the tunnel. And then you emerge on the far side into the Hindu Kush mountains all around you. This is midsummer, there'd be a lot more snow in the winter. But again, a huge extent of mountains and ranges all around you. And here's myself cooling my feet off in the local stream. Nothing there to bite you. Quite happy, a beautiful stream, beautiful sun, lovely stuff. And here was a guest house. In those days, you could just book in and have a lovely time. I mean, best dropped in the guest house near the Russian border, which is now Tajmenistan, which is up there. And basically, <coughs> it was Tajmenistan then. And essentially, and we had a swim there. And what I couldn't get over was because of the altitude, we're at about 7,000 feet here. And uh, I was wheezing like mad, but only doing half the pool width. I was wheezing with the lack of altitude, with the lack of oxygen. So I was amazed at how, what a difference it made. In the evening, in the evening, there was an outdoor film in the evening in Russian, black and white film, in Russian with Afghan subtitles. And everybody gathered around, all chortling and laughing at the wonderful scenes in the film. So there you are. Now, here's what happened towards the end. The, those of you who are, um, basically I'm near the end, so you can wake up now if you want to. And basically speaking, this is what is happening now for planning the way back. Went back, back to the hospital, worked for a few more weeks, and then we had to think about getting back. Now, in late August, then we were starting to get, think about how do we get back out of this place. Now, if you took the northern route, the way we came to Afghanistan up here, we essentially would be went into trouble because there was a big cholera outbreak at the time, and that meeting went, went waiting for nearly a month for the queues. And I, I just couldn't do that. There was no way. So they suggested a different route. They said, well, look, why not go by the western route out here to the south to Iran? Nobody goes that way. It's totally isolated. But you can go that way. And you won't have to wait much longer. So the southwest route to Iran across the desert. 
and you can meet up with this for hand mission hospital in Iran and they had a medical student who'd like a lift with me would I pick him up on the way yippee yippee so that's fair enough I said yes 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 and then my, don't forget my mom was waiting for me in Istanbul no phones no connections she just was assuming I was going to pick her up on time in Istanbul and then of course at the end of it all there was a French ferry pre-booked at the end of September so one month to get back and do all these things on the way and this is the last clinic uh, we held in Mastung saying goodbye to them all you can see all the lovely people all around us there Dr Holland is there himself and this is me saying goodbye about 30 miles south southwest of Quetta and <coughs> effectively you can see she's able to stand and prop herself up prop herself up against the um oh, John Holland. So basically they said goodbye to me and off I took into Baluchistan desert. There we are. Off we go into the desert. And then in a Baluchistan guest house called, in a town called Nokkundi, I ended up chatting with this guy and we had an amazing interfaith discussion till two in the morning about what God was and how did people know about God. And, you know, we, he was very keen into Sufi mysticism and I said, well, it's Christian mysticism as well. And some people, people do seem to get direct experiences of divinity. And we got on like a house in fire, and that's the morning after. We're still talking to each other. Bye bye. But it just shows the kind of communication you can have and did have. And I thought it was very touching that we could have that wonderful conversation that I valued even to this day. <clears throat> and back again, more deserts, empty, empty stuff. <clears throat> And here we are, another little incident is about to happen, lads. Pakistan customs was 40 miles from the Iran border, okay? The customs official told me of a man wanting a lift to a man. And he had driven all the way from Europe, he was an engineer or something, and his name was Mohammed. And I said, well, what the hell, I wouldn't mind company. And I agreed to have him. And then 50 miles later on, I let him drive. No problem. Sucks hadn't he driven all the way out from Europe. And he went off a bend in the desert road. And we rolled over a few times and stopped, thank God, upright. But we did roll over just to remind you in case nothing happened, in case you think nothing happened. And the windscreen was gone again and the car wouldn't start. Now, Mohammed said, look, I see a village, a tiny village in the distance. I've got the name of it next uh, and the horizon. I'll go and see, get some information from them and see what we can do, if anything, because here we are stuck by the roadside. And maybe the weekly bus, he came back and said, maybe the weekly bus will be passing tomorrow morning. Weekly, thank you. And so we slept overnight in a desert storm. We put out the camp beds beside with no tents. We just had put out the tents, put out the camp uh, beds beside the car and slept. And this is the one time I lost my temper because I lifted my head and my pillow went bouncing across with the wind across the desert in the moonlight. And I said, F this and went off after my pillow into the desert trying to get my pillow. And luckily I got my pillow, right? Effing and blinding and grabbing my pillow and dragged him back and said, you stay here, buddy. Don't you go off again. So basically speaking, that was the one time I seriously lost my temper. It doesn't matter if the car goes off the road or any of those things. It's a pillow that can trigger it. So that was it. And we slept overnight in the desert storm and the bus, thank God, stopped for us in the morning. And again, it's the sheer generosity and friendliness of people. They got all got out of the bus and they pushed, they pushed us back onto the road and pushed started us off. 
There we are. There's the car after the crash. We had, you can see the luggage rack. The luggage rack itself seemed to have taken most of the grunt and would have saved us a lot of trouble there. And you can see the big dents and the windows gone again and all that stuff. So you can see the amount of damage there. Uh, but the, the main thing is the car is still intact. And when I was waiting for Mohammed to come back from the village, the village is Taftan, I think, or Majaba. I think it's Taftan, a tiny little village around the corner. You could see it in the distance. No and behold, this fellow cycles past me in the desert. I didn't expect to see this, but there he was. Gave me a wave and cycled on. And there we are, border rescue. These are all people off the bus that were helping us, and they pushed us, pushed the car back onto the road for us. And um, there is uh, Muhammad in the middle, the tall man, and the, this man here is a big tall man, very very nice man. But um, you can see all the and all these helpers. So there we are. We got that thing done. So that was the border rescue. So we had to go on and over the border into Zahadan and they had to go into quarantine camp for three days. And these are fellow medical students that I met in the quarantine camp from England. We had a good chat about a lot of things there. We were sitting there all giving stool samples and getting them checked and making sure we were clear, clear of cholera and didn't have it so checked. And then we pushed into Zahadan for repairs and luckily we got a new windscreen but no starter motor, so we had to push the car to start, or better still, park the car on a slope, if there was a slope. That's the only way you could keep this car going. But it was going, it was still going. And again, very helpful people everywhere. We were lovely people everywhere. And here we are back on the desert road, same old dust, same old gravel, huge distances, huge expanses, and heat. And here again, we have, um, Children, if you'll notice the price, lads, about 10 cents, 10 cents per gallon of fuel. Not bad price. You get a lot of fuel now for a euro, 10 gallons for a euro. So I know the kids all standing there beside the petrol pump. And more desert up the middle of the weekend. We went to, and then we got to Isfahan. Isfahan is a spectacular city. We got to the mission hospital there. And we, unfortunately, again, there are more delays because when we got to the mission hospital, the, um, we were told that the other guy had actually gone away for a couple of days in the south of his south summer, and we'd have to wait another three days. And the clock is ticking all the time with me because I was already out of time for meeting my mom, and there's a ferry at the end of the month, so things were ticking. Anyhow, it's the Han itself is spectacular. I do look at Joanna Lumley's um, program about the Isfahan mosques and everything, this beautiful stuff. This this wonderful square. And the important, it's a double exposed, I'm afraid, this one, but you can see the extraordinary scale of that building because look at how small the people are standing at the bottom of the arch there. So they're absolutely extraordinary. Um, sorry, folks, I've done wrong. The um, scale of this thing is quite enormous. And those are the people at the very bottom down there. So they're the enormous buildings. So off we went, I think it was Tom, his name was, the fellow I picked up, and off we went with him. And he turned up eventually. And essentially, this is the last section of the journey now, just very final stages. As for Han, I, Tom, I picked up Tom. And then we went on to Erzurum in, Eastern Turkey here. And then we had a thousand miles non-stop by day and night to get to Istanbul. And we just drove and drove and drove and dozed and drove, alternate, alternate driving. It was quite scary because at times you felt you were nodding off to sleep and you still had to stay on the road. But you still had to do it because it was very, very, very late. So eventually I found my mom in the address she'd given me one week late I was, and yet she had the patience to stay on and wait. It must be very agonizing for her to wait all those times. And then of course, after that, we took off there. Tom took a flight back from back to England from Istanbul. And mom and I took off to Istanbul on back to on back to Yugoslavia, on into Switzerland. And we called into the one of the expensive 
hotel in Montreal in, 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 in Lake Geneva. And they were, the management was shocked at our appearance. They were casually dressed with dust-stained clothes and everything like that. They nearly showed us the door. I said, look, I've got money. I'm perfectly willing to pay and all this sort of stuff. So eventually they let us in and gave us some breakfast there and a nice chat. But I'm um, just saying, I was amazed at the reaction of people around it. They were looking at these dust-stained travellers coming into the hotel. Good Lord, what? Riff Raff is coming in now, you know. So that was basically it. So basically, there we are, Switzerland, from Switzerland to France to home. And essentially, in France, we in La Havre, we stayed the night in La Havre, and the next day was the ferry. And we had to push the car onto the ferry with mum pushing. How about using your better properly? That's the way to use your mum. And luckily, somebody else came to give us some assistance as well. But that's where it had to happen. So that's my journey, folks. And there's a few lessons that I learned. Well, of course, that the crazy optimism of youth. When you're young, you can do anything. You don't, nothing can happen to you. What could possibly happen to you when you're young? Yippee, yippee. And of course, I could not have journeyed, but for the support and dedication of my family, my friends, my hosts, John Dixon, of course, himself, my friend, and the kindness and help of strangers. And of course, there was the insight into foreign places, a wonderful lesson, wonderful glimpse of people everywhere. Don't forget I had two crashes and no punctures. How about that? That's not bad, is it? Get, if you go to travel, get hold of a Volkswagen variant, air-cooled, no troubles with water cooling, and that will get you across the world. And you won't have any punctures either. So just telling you, you know, two crashes and two no punctures. And certainly a lot of luck and almost certainly a little divine protection, I'm quite sure. Thank you. Sorry for keeping you so long, no. but I've just Tim, made my seven Tim, minutes over. Take Tim, care. it was brilliant. Can, can you stop the share there, Tim? Can, can, can you stop to just press sh stop share? Don't find the button first. Stop sharing. Yeah. Stop. Uh, could be don't. Yeah. Oh, right. That mm -hmm. was brilliant, Tim. And uh, there's definitely a book and a film, I'd say, as well, and that. Maybe. Um, it was fantastic. No, does anyone want to ask any question? Uh, I didn't see anything in the chat, but if anyone would like to ask Tim a, a question, and we're going to finish off with a bit of music in a minute. Tim, where is the car now? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Any comments? Uh, 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 Tim, uh, Harry had a question for you there, Tim. What's the question? I didn't hear it. So, where is the car now, Tim? <laughs> where, where's who now? <laughs> where is the car? Where's the Volkswagen variant now? Oh, God almighty. <laughs> <laughs> I kept it for about a year, six months or a year afterwards. And I drove into, there was one lovely scene once. I don't forget, I was still in my final medical school year, I don't forget. And I lived in Sandy Mount area and digs there. And I remember at one point, a car was in front of me. And just as I was pulling up, a little old lady in the back of the car opened the window, not thinking, opened the door, not thinking, and the door bashed my car. <laughs> and we got out and saw my car, which was the same, all the dents and bashes, and said, God, did I do that? He said, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. I, 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 said, did of course, yes. I did, I did manage to get rid of it for almost nothing later. But it's really, it's still up to the journey, I can tell you, yes. Yeah, yeah. Very good. Fascinating story, Tim. Most, most, most uh, entertaining. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else uh, have a question for Tim? I'll just say I saw Sir Henry Holland and I looked for it in line and I got it for you, Tim. Sorry? I, I looked for that book online and I picked up a second hand copy for you. Oh my God, did you? Yes. Yeah, I did. I am, I am. I did go online to Amazon and I saw a second-hand, I saw a second-hand copy on Amazon, 
and I trust. But I'm still searching my house for the famous book. I know. If but any of you get hold of it, it is worth it's worth reading because it's amazing kinds of things, you know. Yeah. Yes. So Harry, uh, Larry has one for you now, isn't it, Larry? No, no but I have it. Uh, uh, that's what I mean. Yeah. Yeah, it'll be. It's on its way. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Very good. Thank you. Thank you. And anyone else, put your hand up there if you if you have any. Oh, Tim, Tim, you're you're muted, Tim. You're muted. And who's muted? Uh, no, Tim, my brother there is muted. Uh, 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 Bernard, can I just ask Tim there about Harry? Did you get um, an answer to the population question you were asking Tim a while back? No, no, I didn't ask him. He was Jim was. I, 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 I'd say, I'd say some of those populations are conservative now. Tim, I'd say, um, uh, Istanbul is up around twelve million or maybe fourteen million. They actually haven't got a definitive uh, population. I was there about four years ago, and it's a fascinating. As you rightly said, it's a fascinating city and well worth a visit. But the, the population in Istanbul now is probably doubled. Oh, I'm sure that I forgot to revise the population for that. Yes. Yeah, yeah, no, no problem. But uh, yeah, and Ankara is probably a bit more as well. I imagine. That, that's one little point about Istanbul is that every single car in Istanbul, certainly in my day, had a dent in it. They're all just crashing <laughs> off each other, driving through the traffic. You know, have a good time, lads. <laughs> Before you. So, Very good. So, incredible mm -hmm. Right, Tim O'Donovan, there will you will you ask whatever you want to. I just wanted to know is he getting a lot of money off Volkswagen <laughs> to sponsor him? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Peanuts, peanuts, peanuts. Yes, 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 yes. And you had great patience with Muhammad. <clears throat> if he did that to my car, I wouldn't be saying what a nice fellow he was. <laughs> and he, he did a print of my shoe on his backside for a start. <laughs> yeah, but I suppose you claimed an insurance when you got back. No, I don't think I was able to claim an insurance. No, no, no. <laughs> it was very interesting. Well done, Tim. Very good. And uh, you know, but it is funny. Every now and then I get flashbacks of rolling over in the desert. It's funny. You actually physically feel yourself rolling with the car. I just went over twice in the desert like that and came back up to its feet again. Uh, I still sometimes feel myself being strapped in, thank God for the seat belt. And by the way, in that crash, the um, there were I was a spare fuel in the back seat, about 10 gallons of um, of fuel was in the back seat as well in cans. And I tell you, I never got out of a car quicker. In my life, <laughs> I can imagine the car yeah. blow up, but it didn't blow up. No, thank God. Right, is there any anyone else? No, oh, uh, Dave, Dave, you're mute up there. You have to unmute. We can't hear you. Yeah, Dave. Right. Is that yeah. yeah, you're fine now. Hi, Tim. Thank you. Good to see you. Thanks, Tim. That was wonderful. Tim, did you have any problems getting fuel for the car? Sure, no problem. It was a Volkswagen, uh, it was a petrol car, so there was no yeah. problem. And all the way across, after all, I'm in the place where the Arabs have all the fuel in the world, so what's the problem? Yeah. yeah. No, no, but seriously, the, 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 we did a spare fuel, as I said, in the back of the car anyway. And, and for some of the long hops, you wondered that you went out of fuel. I accept your point completely, but luckily, you were able to plan that if I was going more than 400 miles in a hop with no villages or towns, sometimes you would top up from the tank in the back seat. But nice. I, normally you wouldn't have to do such a long hop. And normally yeah, there was uh, fuel in towns, yes. Um, the only other point about fuel and things, the, the no, it was, it was, uh, fluid was the least of our problems. One of the problems we did have was that a carne hadn't been paid fully, apparently, and oh. it got stuck on the border and had to pay an extra few hundred pounds, which in those wow. days was quite a lot of money, and uh, for the import of the car over the border into Pakistan. I would highly recommend you to have a look at Declan's book about the modern Pakistan. It is very frightening. About both about the history and the fragmentation of Pakistan into a very turbulent, disordered state. 
and it is worth um, it's very uh, I read it recently and I am very disturbed by it and it's very sad to see the chaos and difficulties that is happening there in what I remember as a wonderful country in my time. Right. Very uh, good. And anyone else? Right. Uh, yeah. I, 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 jury. Yeah, no, just a comment there, um, Tim. That was really a fascinating talk. Um, I just read a book a couple of years ago about the uh, the Northwest Frontier during the time of the, the British, and that was the area of of that uh, put a stop to the expansion of the British Empire in the area. These some of the tribes there never stopped fighting. They they kept rebelling time and time again, yeah. and uh, they really they really made it very tough for the for a lot of the, the British um, uh, soldiers out there. Yeah. But you're, absolutely, you're absolutely right, Jerry, and Declan's book brings it out very strongly. You have proud, independent peoples, and then people coming to dominate them, and they're all fighting back against the domination. Now, even in Baluchistan, which I've said is 40% of Pakistan's area, because of its desert and so on, there was a huge rebellion took place against this central government, and that partly why the place is fragmented so badly recently because of the uh, attempted rebellion by the Baluchistan people to form a, a separate state of Pakistan, a separate, a separate entity. So there's, there's so many proud peoples all trying to fight for their own identity, and it's a sad thing, and you would like to see an ability to reach out across the frontiers, and it's not happening, even in Pakistan or India. They're still doing their silly games, so and they're both nuclear countries. So it is very sad to see them taking routes which could be transcended if possible. Now I, I did mention it very briefly, you know, into into the state of Pakistan that he won. And the feeling is Jinnah was just a very deeply disappointed man by the way the whole thing eventually materialized. And any of you've seen I'm sure many of you've seen the film Gandhi. And that is very moving about the terrible partition scenes and terrible situations about politics there. Yeah. So uh, I recommend it if you haven't seen it. Well, well, Tim, we want to thank yeah, you. Anyway. We want to thank Tim anyway, but we have two items there to cover before we're going to have a tiny bit of music there in a minute. But just before that, I have to make a tiny announcement there that in, in two weeks' time, we'll have our monthly get-together for music, poetry, song and story two weeks time tonight and then a month oh no the first tuesday of may we'll have a night of poetry if anyone's interested but um no we're going to have two items jory o'neill is going to do a song and then followed by larry and larry is going to to play us out tonight with the ukulele and once again thank you tim for a very interesting talk thank you Thank you, Tom. We love Jory O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, well, there was another famous tour of the area back in the time of the Mughal Empire um, in the 17th century, and uh, pu pu um, by a, a New Delhi princess on her way to find to meet her husband. And uh, it was a famous poem, long, very long poem by um, by uh, Tom Thomas Moore, uh, which was one of the best-selling poems of the 19th century. And uh, some of you will be familiar with a song that came from that um, came from that um, poem. Uh, the the Lala Rook was the name of the was the name of the poem, and um, and we'll be finished in two seconds. The song is Bendemir Stream, which uh, some of us older people will be familiar with from a recording of John Charles Thomas, which used to be popular on on um, Radio Weirden in my young days. Uh, but a lot of that poem, Lala Rook, took place, the settings were in modern day Pakistan. <laughs> There's a bower of roses. <laughs> I bend the mere stream, and the nightingale sings round it all the day long. 
In the time of my boyhood was like a sweet dream to sit in the roses and hear the bird song. That bower and its music I'll never forget. For oft when alone in the bloom of the year, I think is the nightingale singing there yet. Are the roses still bright by the camp and the mere? Yes, those roses soon wither that hung o'er the wave. But some blossoms were gathered while freshly they shone. And the dew was distilled from the flowers that gave. All the fragrance of summer, of when summer was gone. Thus memory draws from the light here it eyes, a fragrance that breathes of it many's the year. Thus bright to my soul, as twas then to my eyes. The sweet blossoms that shone by the camp and the mere. Apologies to Thomas Moore there for having to change a little bit of the lyrics. Brilliant, <laughs> on, brilliant story. Thank you. 